if you don't have a lot of experience looking at and interpreting spectral plots and time frequency plots, then this video is for you. I created this video to provide a kind of quick and dirty introduction to spectral analyses and time frequency analyses. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. That's actually the whole point of the rest of this course. But before we get too far into talking about the analyses, I want to make sure that you are fairly comfortable with looking at time frequency plots and thinking about time frequency plots and basically what to think about, what to look at when you are confronted with a time frequency plot. So let's begin. Here we see a signal in the time domain. You can see that there's a lot of activity happening in this signal. There's periods of rhythmic activity. There's periods that look a little more, I don't know, chaotic or something. This is the time domain. And here we have a graph that's going to be in the frequency domain. This is going to be a power spectrum that we are going to build up. So how do you build up a power spectrum from this time domain signal? That's done through an operation called the Fourier transform. And of course, the next section of this course is all about the Fourier transform. But the general idea of how the Fourier transform works is that you start with your signal and then you take a sine wave. This is a pure sine wave at some frequency and you just line them up on top of each other. And then you ask the question, how similar does this signal look like the uh, sine wave? So how much do the blue line and the yellow line look like each other? And if they don't look anything like each other, then you would get a low value here. And if they look a little bit like each other, you get kind of a middle value here. And if they really look a lot like each other, then you get a large value up here. So you make a plot, so you compute some measure of similarity, which I will talk about in the future. And then you calculate how uh, similar is the signal and uh, the sine wave. And you generate a, a plot, so a bar at this particular frequency corresponding to the frequency of the sine wave. So we can see that the signal looks this much like the sine wave at this frequency. In other words, there is this amount of energy in this time domain signal, in the blue signal, at this frequency here for this yellow sine wave. So here you see the sine wave going all throughout time, from the very beginning of the signal to the very end of the signal. And when you repeat this procedure for many different frequencies, so different sine waves with different frequencies, you are going to end up building up a spectrum that looks like this. So here you see the frequency of the sine wave and this uh, y-axis here corresponds to like the amount of similarity or the energy between the signal and the sine wave at these different frequencies. Now, this particular graph is shown in a relative metric. So I've computed a normalized measure of energy or similarity relative to a kind of baseline or reference time window. So of course you'll learn more about that later. But the idea is that the signal looks a lot like a sine wave at 5 hertz, and the signal doesn't really look anything like a sine wave at 45 hertz. Okay, so this gives us a power spectrum. I call this a static spectrum because it gives us one static glimpse into the features, the rhythmic features of the entire signal. So here we don't distinguish between what's happening in this part of the signal and what's happening in this part of the signal. But you can see it's obvious when you just look at this signal that there are, uh, that the spectral content of the signal changes over time. And those temporal changes, those temporal dynamics are not visible in this spectrum. And that's why I call this a static spectrum. So what we want to do is basically take this line, take this representation, and split it up over different parts of the time window. And that's going to give us a plot that looks like this. And this is called, well here I call it a dynamic spectrum, but it's called a time frequency plot. And it's called a time frequency plot because it shows how information changes over time, that's on the x-axis, and also over frequency. So it's a little bit different from this plot because here we have frequency on the x-axis, here we have frequency on the y-axis. And the idea is that this line here, this spectrum, actually comes from just one 
time window, one brief moment of time. So imagine that you would color these positive values red and these negative values blue. And then you could like spin this or rotate this line so that it's one column in this matrix. So here you see at lower frequencies, it's red. That means it's, it's positive here. And at higher frequencies, it gets blue, it's negative. So that corresponds to this piece down here. So this is a really powerful way of looking at the information in a signal because we can see not only what are the spectral characteristics, so the changes over different frequency, but also how those changes over frequency are evolving over time. So we get a whole lot of information packed into this dynamic spectrum or this time frequency plot. So that is the nutshell version of a time frequency plot. What I want to talk about now is what to look at, what questions to ask when you are looking at a time frequency plot like this. So I'm now going to introduce you to my own personal five-step plan for inspecting time frequency results like a pro. Now I don't have a patent on this five-step plan because I don't believe that I or anyone else could make money or get anything useful out of it other than, you know, scientific benefits. Anyway, here is the five-step plan. So step one, this is the first thing that you do when you look at a time frequency plot. You have to determine what is being shown in the plot. Now, mostly, the most common feature of the data to show in a time frequency plot is power. That's the amount of energy in the signal at a given point in time at a given frequency. But you will learn throughout this course that power is not the only thing that can be shown in the plot. There are many other features of the data that can be visualized in a time frequency plot, like connectivity, correlation with behavior, phase dynamics, all sorts of things. Okay, so step two is to inspect the ranges and the limits of the plot. And in particular, you want to check for what's on the X and Y axes. You want to have a look at the color scale. You want to have a look at the boundaries. So the earliest and latest points in time and the lowest and, and highest frequencies that are shown in the plot. So just looking at the ranges and the limits. Then we get to step three, which is to look at the results that are in the plot. So what kinds of features, what kinds of patterns do you see in the time frequency plot? Are they distributed over time or frequency, or are they localized in some narrow frequency or narrow time window? And in general, we collect a lot of data over a lot of electrodes, different conditions, and so on. So in a time frequency plot, you're probably only going to be looking at a small selection of the data. Maybe it's only from one electrode, one measurement sensor, maybe the data are only shown from one particular frequency window or time range. So you want to look for that. And then the fourth step is to link the results to the experiment design. So what was happening in the experiment? What was the research participant or the experimental animal or whatever, you know, wherever the data come from, what was that organism doing at the time when the data were being measured? And how do you see that represented in the plots? For a typical trial-based experiment design, there's gonna be a time equals zero. So this is like the onset of a visual stimulus, or maybe it's when the subject pressed a button or, or typed something on the keyboard. So you just wanna look for uh, these experiment events and relate them to the data. And then the final step is to understand the statistical, so the inferential statistical procedures that are shown in the plot. Is there any thresholding? Uh, are there multiple comparisons, corrections that are applied? Or are the data, uh, are the analyses hypothesis driven or more exploratory? And I'm gonna talk more in the last major section of this course about inferential statistics on time frequency plots. Okay, so this is an explanation of the five steps. Let's go through it in practice. So here you see a time frequency plot. Imagine, you know, you see this at, uh, at a conference or in a publication, and what do you do? So you, you call up your five-step plan, and let's start with step one. So determine what is being shown in the plot. So we can see from the title, this is dB, that stands for decibel, converted or normalized time frequency power. Okay, so of course you haven't learned yet what 
decibel normalization means, but this does give some information about what we are looking at. So this shows the time frequency power converted into decibel units. Now for step two. So in step two, uh, we inspect the ranges and the limits of the plots. So we can look at the color limit, for example, and we see that it's a symmetric color scale, which I often recommend. So the negative side and the positive side are the same magnitude. And that also tells us that zero, which is uh, relative, so no relative changes in power, corresponds to this greenish color and that you see around here. So that's helping us interpret this. And then we see the time axes go from, looks like minus 300 milliseconds, here's time zero, up to one second. So in total, we have around you know a second and a quarter, uh, or second and a third of time that's being shown in this plot. And then we can also look at the frequency axis and we see, uh, we don't see exactly what is the precise lowest frequency, but I guess it's maybe one or two hertz and it goes up to 40 hertz. So this is telling us about the range of the plots. Then step three involves looking at the results. And here we wanna take a preliminary glance. And some of the things that we're looking for here are uh, for example, whether these features on the time frequency plane are localized or distributed. So for example, you see this blue patch is kind of fairly distributed over time. It seems to last for 800 or maybe 900 milliseconds, so it's almost a second, but it's fairly limited in frequency. So it goes from 20, it's most, most of this goes from 20 to 25 hertz. And here we have this little burst that goes up to 30 or maybe even up to 35 hertz. And then we see a couple of other features here that all tend to be a little bit band limited. So they are existing in a narrow frequency band. So uh, narrow on the Y axis. That is relevant for interpreting time frequency features because to interpret something as an oscillation, as a narrow band activity, you want it to be narrow in the frequency range, so limited on the y-axis. And you'll learn more about this later in the course. Other things to look for are whether there are features in the time frequency plot that are cut off by the axes. So for example, here you see some little blue patch and we don't see the top of this blue patch. So we don't actually know from this plot whether this thing continues up, you know, maybe this goes up to like 200 Hertz. Maybe this is a really broadband effect or maybe it stops at 41 Hertz and it's just cut off on the plot. So there's some uncertainty here and, you know, similar story here. So there are some features of this plot that are well constrained inside the plot. We see all the boundaries and some other features of the plot where it's a little bit unclear whether these are more localized or distributed. Step four is to link the results to the experiment design. Now this is step four is going to be not really possible for us now because we're just kind of looking at this plot in isolation. We don't have any more information. But presumably, this is in the context of a publication or uh, a lecture, a scientific uh, lecture. So then you would, you would know more information about what kind of event was happening here, what was happening here during the experiment. There seems to be a lot of important brain dynamics that are happening here. And so presumably, there was something meaningful that happened in the experiment uh, that corresponded to roughly half a second after the trial onset here. All right, and then finally we get to step five, which is to understand the statistical procedures, the inferential statistics. Now, when I look at this plot, I see absolutely zero evidence of inferential statistical tests being performed. Sometimes the statistical tests are drawn with boxes, so you can see some region, or sometimes there are contour lines that are drawing out regions that are statistically significant. I don't see any indication of statistical procedures being applied to this plot. So that means that's not necessarily bad. We don't need to have statistics for everything, but it does mean that we should interpret this plot more qualitatively than quantitatively. So we don't know, for example, whether this little thing here, this little blip here is, you know, whether that is real and meaningful or whether that's just a, bit, a little bit of noise and sampling variability. Now, of course, we can guess. I think, you know, this 
big thing. We can look at these really big, prominent, high power features and interpret, so uh, guess that these are meaningful and something like this is probably not meaningful. I would guess if you reproduced this experiment in a different person, these four features would remain because they seem quite prominent and this thing would probably disappear or maybe you know it would be replaced with a blue thing. Now, I don't know this for sure, I'm just guessing. So that's the answer to step five. In this case, we don't see any statistics, so we just interpret the data qualitatively. And that right there is the five step plan for interpreting time frequency re results like a pro. I hope you found this video to be illuminating and also enticing and exciting to continue through the rest of the course to learn all of the mathematical and implementational details of it producing and interpreting a plot like this. In the next video, I'm going to tell you about the empirical data sets that we will use for the rest of this course, and those are the data sets from which you will produce these kinds of plots.